My name is Chris. I'm the pastor here at Christian Chapel, and it's just such an honor to worship with you today. Whether you're in the room or online with us, we're thrilled um, to be part of your Easter experience this year. The last seven or eight weeks at at Christian Chapel, we've been working through a story in Mark chapter 5 about a man who is tormented, a man who's isolated, a man whose life looks hopeless and helpless. And Jesus shows up and brings freedom to him. And and so we've talked for the last several weeks about how Jesus comes to bring freedom and life to each of us. Today on Easter Sunday, it's it's kind of a bridge for us between where we've been in Mark chapter 5 and where we're going over the next six or eight weeks. Uh, Starting next week, we're starting a new series of messages called Witness, uh, Tell Your Story. And so we're going to explore some of the conversion stories, encounters that people have with Jesus in the New Testament and see how it not only changed their lives, but Jesus always changes us to change the world around us. And so my hope over the next six or eight weeks is that, uh, first of all, we all embrace our own conversion story. And secondly, that we all understand God wants to use our story to tell his story and invite others into it as well. Um, Today, like I said, Mark chapter five is going to be our bridge between those two experiences. And we're going to talk about the amazing stories that we see not only in the scripture, but that Jesus writes for us. So if you have a Bible, uh, jump with me to Mark chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 1. Make sure we're all on the same page here. It says, They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed." We'll focus on those last couple of words there. All the people were amazed. I think we can all agree we love amazing stories, right? Your, your favorite books, your favorite movies. I doubt any of you think my favorite are boring stories. Uh, like, you, you know, you're, when you think of people you enjoy having conversations with, it's probably not the person who tells you about their for 30 minutes, right? Like there are more excited, which if you have a great, I'm sure it's great. Just please tell someone else. Um, no offense, Dave Paulson. Uh, you know, I, I saw that. This deep offense in your heart. Like you'd been personally attacked. And that is not it at all. Your garden is awesome. Um, you know, but for the rest of us, maybe there are some topics of conversation that, that aren't quite all that interesting. We prefer really extreme, extravagant stories. We prefer the stories of the, the war heroes, the, the experimenters, the inventors, the people who overcome amazing obstacles to achieve something that no one has ever done before. I was reminded of this recently. So Angie and I, we have, uh, we have three kids who are all teenagers now. And if you know anything about teenagers, you know that they have expensive tastes. 
Like if, if there's anything expensive, they want it. Uh, whether they need it or not, they want it. And so one of the things that, that we've developed with our kids is trying to help them have this understanding of just because mom and I can afford something doesn't mean we're going to afford something, right? And, and so there, there are these lines where they will come all the time of, I want this. And, and our response is, that sounds like a great thing for you to save your money and buy yourself. Um, and so we, our, our middle son, Corbin, he is the saver in the family. So normally the other two, they're the spenders. If we tell them to save their money, like they forget about it and they've already bought something else. But Corbin's a saver. And so a couple years ago, he came to us and he said, hey, I really, for Christmas, I would love to have uh, some virtual reality goggles. And, and I was like, oh, that sounds cool. I would love for you to have those too. How much are they? And he showed me how much they were. And I said, that sounds like a wonderful thing for you to buy for yourself. Um, and so Corbin, he saved up his money a couple. I mean, I think he did two, wor- two years worth of Christmas, two years worth of birthdays, saved up all his money, didn't spend it on anything. And then he bought the, the virtual reality goggles. And like every good parent, as soon as he bought them, um, I said, let me try those. Uh, so, so I slapped them on and it turns out I'm bad at virtual reality games, just like I am regular video games. And, and so I I didn't really mess with them too much until this, this last week, I read an article about a man named Alex Honnold. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with him. If you've seen the, the documentary Free Solo, it's about Alex Honnold. He, he climbed the face of El Capitan in Yosemite without any ropes or any assistance, which is a several thousand sheer granite face of a mountain. I mean, just terrifying. So we watched the documentary as a family, but then I heard this week that he had uh, combined with a company to make a documentary specifically for these virtual reality goggles. So uh, this week I asked Corbin, like, hey, will you figure out how to download that? Because I don't, I don't understand any of it. And then will you show me how to do it? And, and so last night I stood in my living room um, and I climbed some of the iconic peaks in the world. And it was amazing because unlike, like when I just watched the documentary on my TV, it made me a little queasy. But when I slapped these on, I, it was completely immersive, right? And, and in that space, I am with these climbers as they're climbing up these vertical spaces, sometimes as they're climbing backwards and upside down over them. And they, they filmed it in such a way where wherever they are in the mountain, you can put these goggles on and you can turn all the way around and see a 360 degree view of what they see. You can look up and you can see how much of the route is left to be climbed. And most terrifying, you can look down. And I, in the middle of my living room in Tulsa, Oklahoma, thought I was going to die last night. Like, I thought I was going to fall right off the edge. In fact, I think I only took about five minutes and I took them off and gave them back to Corbin and said, bud, I can't do this or I'm going to be too sick to go to church tomorrow. Like, it, it was that kind of immersive experience. Now, when we think of amazing stories... That's what we think of, right? We think of people who are doing things that no one else has ever done before. What what I want us to consider this morning, though, is because of the resurrection of Jesus, you and I are invited in to the most amazing story that the world has ever seen, right? Which means your normal, ordinary, mundane, average life has the potential to be an amazing story that God uses to draw others into an experience of his resurrection. Now, as as much as I loved the ability to, to be there and to see what it would feel like to climb some of these massive walls around the world, I would love it even more if the scriptures had a virtual reality feature for us. Right, whereas as I'm reading through the resurrection story in Matthew, I can slap on the goggles and I can look around and experience and hear and smell and see everything that's going on. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 6, we get a very brief description of the resurrection. The angel meets the women who have come to mourn and they, he says, he is not here, he is risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. It's a reminder to us that Jesus really did rise from the dead. It's a reminder that he predicted he would rise from the dead, that this was not a surprise to him in any way. And yet I love that last line that the angel tells the women, come and see the place where he lay. See, the women aren't just being invited to observe the resurrection story. They're being invited to participate in the resurrection story. 
They are witnesses to it. And then they go back and they begin to tell the disciples what has happened. It's a a reminder to us that Easter is the most amazing story. The resurrection of Jesus is the most amazing story in the world. There's nothing else that compares to it. I mean, just just think of the events of today and, and let them serve as our proof that the resurrection of Jesus is unlike anything else that happens in the world. There, there are things you did today that you don't do every other Sunday of the year. Right? For some of us, we joined with our family, our friends, we came to church. That's a different experience. That's a new experience. Why do we do that? Because at some level, we recognize there's something special about this day when we remember the resurrection. For some of us, we, we put on some pastels, right? You matched with your family. You did, hopefully none of you had my experience. My wife does a great job every year. She had bought all the stuff. And last night I rubbed the new shirt she got me up against some kind of grease somewhere in our home. And, and so that shirt is now in the dirty clothes and, and we did our best, right? But, but there's this, this space. We have Easter baskets. We have Easter eggs. We have Easter bunnies. We take Easter pictures. We have Easter lunches. We do all of this kind of stuff. And, and you can get into arguments on should we or shouldn't we. But what I, what I want to suggest to you today is even our culture here in our nation and all over the world recognizes there is something special about Easter. And even if they don't want to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus because of all that means for them, they still want to participate in the day. And what that means to us is today marks one of the most significant moments in one of the most amazing stories that has ever been told in the world, which is an encouragement to us, right? And, and, and this resurrection story, it is so profound, so mind-blowing that as you read through the Gospels, you see Jesus dropping hints and preparing us for his resurrection, In Mark chapter 5, the the story we read earlier today, if you can read it in parallel with the story of the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, you see some some really interesting similarities. So in in both Mark chapter 5 and in the story of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, we see that evil attacks with everything it has. That it has isolated its victims from the rest of society. That from a community perspective, the situation is hopeless. In Mark 5, they think the man will live this way forever. In the story of Jesus' crucifixion, he dies, he's buried, and he's sealed in a tomb. In both situations, the enemy has isolated its victim in a cemetery, and everyone else has left. In both moments where it seems like all hope is lost, God works according to his power to achieve his purposes to tell his resurrection story. And in Mark chapter 5, the man is set free. And in the story of Jesus' resurrection, the stone is rolled away and he walks back into life never to die again. See, the the story of Jesus, it's unlike any other religious leader, any teacher, any prophet who had gone before him or who has come along since then. Every other teacher, no matter how big their following becomes, no matter how many people gather to hear them speak, no matter how many people commit their lives to follow their way of teaching, every other teacher dies, is buried, and stays in the grave. Jesus is the only one that you can't go worship at his grave today. He's the only one whose bones do not remain in the ground. This is what makes Easter Sunday such a special day. Not all of our celebrations, not all of our traditions and observations, but that it's rooted in the historical reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's a reminder to us that what he was doing then, he is still doing now. And it's not just a story that we see and observe. It's a story that we too are invited to participate in. The women are told, come in and see. In Mark chapter 5, he's told, go home and tell. But in both situations, there's an expectation that when you encounter the story of the resurrection, you experience it and then you begin to share it with others. And we, which means we kind of have to get to this point of understanding that my story, your story, has a potential to be amazing. Now, that's, that's hard for some of us to understand. Again, if we said, hey, there is a, uh, there's a documentary crew, 
and they're going to show up at your house tomorrow with the 360-degree cameras, and they're going to mount some GoPros on you, and they're going to film everything you do, and we're going to turn it into a virtual reality documentary for the whole world to watch. There are very, we'd be terrified for a lot of reasons, right? But there are very few of us who would be like, it's about time. My life is really awesome. I think this is something the world needs. Most of us, we are convinced more than anyone else of the ordinariness of our life. Right? And, and you're thinking virtual reality, like we just had a baby. It's all diapers all the time. Nobody wants to see that. You're like, do, do they really want to send a crew to watch me work on spreadsheets for 10 hours a day? Do they want to come with me and sit in meetings? Do they want to watch me read books and type on my computer? Right? Do they want to watch me mow the lawn and clean the house and do the laundry and act like an Uber driver for my kids all over town? Like there doesn't seem like there's that much in my life or in your life that is all that extraordinary. And yet what the scriptures tell us is when Jesus invades your life and you begin to tell that story, others will be amazed by it. Now, there are people in the world who, who would say, no, my story is amazing. It should be told. Uh, and, and really, when that happens, there's one of two options. Either they've experienced the transforming power of Jesus Christ, and they recognize that every moment now drips with eternal significance, or they're delusional. And there's really no middle ground. Most of the people we interact with who would say, you know what, my life is awesome. Let me tell you about it. We tend to kind of shy away from those types of people. And yet, as you read this story in Mark chapter 5, as you see the encounter of the women at the tomb of Jesus, we are reminded that because of the intervention of Christ in our lives, we now have a story that's worth telling. Right? And, and so we, we just have to make this decision along the way of, okay, my, my story is amazing, but it's not amazing because of me. In Mark chapter 5, his story is not amazing because of his intelligence or his eloquence. It's not amazing. Because all he had done to contribute was act like a madman and be driven out of his home. In Mark 5, his story is amazing because of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 28, the women's story is amazing because of Jesus. And for you and I today, our stories are amazing because of Jesus. And it, it's not that you have this incredible, and some of you do. I know I've heard your stories of overcoming incredible obstacles. I've heard about the businesses you've started. I've seen the healthy families that you have been a part of. I've witnessed your influence in the community. And all of that is great, and all of that is wonderful, but it's never our successes, it's never our triumphs that are going to draw people to Jesus. In Mark chapter 5, the amazing story he told was, while I was hopeless and helpless, Jesus showed up and set me free. The women in, in Matthew 28, when they go to the tomb that day, they are not going expecting resurrection. They are going in their grief to continue their mourning process. And so the story the man tells in Mark chapter 5 is, let me tell you about the day Jesus showed up and changed everything for me. The thing that amazes the people is not his success. It's not his wealth. It's not his power. It's just the normalness of his life. It's that he just lives and works. And he's at peace and he's at rest and it stands in contradiction to the way that he used to live. You know, which, which is encouraging to you and me because it means I don't have to be someone special. They don't have to make documentaries about my life for my story to matter and my story to be significant. But when I experience the resurrection power of Christ, when you experience the resurrection power of Christ, then every element of your life now becomes a platform to share the story of Jesus with the world around you. And so, so it just kind of gets you to this point of, hey, you've got to tell your story. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus tells the man, go home and tell how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. And it says, as the man went, all the people were amazed. So Jesus knew two things that would happen. He knew, first of all, this man had an incredible story. And he knew people would be amazed by it and would be drawn to him through it. But there's a space in the middle that required this man's participation. And the same is still true for you and I. Jesus knows he's written an amazing story in our life, whether we recognize it or not. And he knows if we will live out and tell our story, others will be drawn to him because of it. And yet this space in the middle is our obedience to his direction to tell our story. And again, you think, but, but I, I, I just don't have a lot of training. Neither did that man in Mark 5. He, all he had was a story. All he had was an encounter. 
And that was all Jesus sent him back with. And in doing so, he becomes one of the first preachers in that region to declare who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. He's preparing the ground because in a short time, the story of the resurrected Christ is going to come back across the lake, is going to take root in that community. And all across that region of 10 cities, there are going to be people who say, Jesus, we've heard about him from this guy who told us what he did for him. But it requires our participation. In Mark chapter 5, when Jesus performs this incredible miracle, the people of the, the village and the surrounding area, they come out and they see this man dressed and sitting in his right mind by Jesus. They see 2,000 pigs dead and floating in the lake, and they are understandably terrified by what they're experiencing. And their response to their fear is to ask Jesus to leave. And Jesus honors their request, but not before leaving behind a living parable testifying to his power. He says, look, I'll leave, but he's staying. And not only is he staying, but he's going to start traveling around telling everyone everywhere your story. If you think of your own story and coming to follow Jesus, it's likely that at some point you encountered Jesus and rejected him. That you heard about who he was and thought, not now or not, not ever. But Jesus, in his kindness towards you, began to put people in your life who just kept telling their stories who just kept talking to you about what Jesus had done. A neighbor, a parent, a classmate, a friend, a co-worker. And time and time again, no matter how many times you would reject, there was someone else coming with a new story to tell about what God had done in their life. Now, this is for Angie and I, this is our prayer for our friends and family who don't know Jesus. Of Lord, if they're tired of hearing from us, will you give them some other voices to get tired of too? Will you surround them with coworkers and neighbors? Will you send new friendships and relationships? Will you start to move in their circle of close friends and draw them to you so that everywhere they look in every conversation they have, they're hearing stories of what you have done and how amazing your grace is that has changed their life. But all of that requires that we tell our story. Right? That's your job. And your job to tell your story again, it's not about, well, I guess I better go do some amazing things. I better book that trip to climb big mountains. I better go try and, and succeed at the highest level of business so I can earn a hearing for the Lord. In our culture, people are not primarily looking for someone to teach them how to succeed more. They're looking for those who are content where they are. Those who have peace, those who have hope, those who have joy. That the world is full of people who can tell you how to make more money, how to climb higher ranks in your job, how to achieve more at school. But it's severely lacking in people who say this is how to be at peace and at rest. This is how to interact with those around you. This is how to love your family. This is how to honor your spouse. This is how to raise your children. This is how to walk through difficult seasons. This is how you endure grief. This is how you process suffering. This is how you face all of these situations that are common to us all. See, when you begin to understand your story matters, not because it's extraordinary in its own right, but because God has invaded your ordinary circumstances with his supernatural love and hope and joy and peace and patience. In that space, then, you can start to tell your story. Imagine with me what it's, it's like for this man in Mark chapter 5. Jesus tells him, go home. Go home and tell everyone all that the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. And he goes home and he tells the story. And then somewhere along the way, he decides, well, I can't just stay home. I've told everyone here. And then he begins to travel in this region of 10 cities and he's telling the story. But what I think is most likely is he's not going into each town, gathering large crowds to come around him. But he's walking through his, own his hometown. He's engaging with his family and friends. He's traveling to other areas and he's using every single thing around him that reminds him of Jesus to tell others about what Jesus has done for him. And so perhaps it's as he walks by the lake and he, he tells whoever's with him, hey, have I ever told you about the day that Jesus came across the lake and he got out of the boat and my life's never been the same. Maybe he hears the clang of metal in his hometown and as he hears it, he looks up and he makes eye contact with the blacksmith who made the chains that his family attached to him to try to hold him captive. Maybe he walks over to say, hey, remember me? 
Let me tell you about what happened. Let me tell you about what Jesus did. Maybe as he travels from town to town, he sees some sharp rocks along the path and he stops and grabs one and turns to his companion and says, have I ever told you about how I used to slice my arms and legs with these looking for some relief from the terror that was inside of me? Maybe it's as he sits down for dinner with his family and friends and they're at peace and they're at rest and laughter is a common thing. And he says, have I, you guys remember when all of this seemed impossible? Maybe it's when he lays his children down to bed at night and he's telling them how much he loves them and how happy he is to be with them. And he pauses and says, kids, you know, there was a time I never thought any of this would be possible. Maybe it's in the morning when he gets up and he gets dressed and he combs his hair and he, he just catches a glimpse of himself and recognizes there is, there's a peace and a serenity even in my physical appearance that I never thought I would have known. All the wildness is gone. All the evil is gone. What would he have done? He would have used every moment of every day in every situation to tell his story as the story of Jesus. And you and I, this is where we can tell ours as well. It's not about have you achieved more and have you done more and have you been better than everyone around you. It's have you experienced Jesus in every moment of your life. Because when you do, people will notice and people will want to know why. Just recently I had a conversation with a, a friend who uh, in her late 20s, early 30s, returned to faith in Jesus. And, and by returned, I mean really kind of came to him for the first time. She had no prior experience with him other than occasionally going to church as a teenager. And she said, my life had become dark and went to a very dangerous and unsafe place. And just in my short interactions with her over a matter of a couple of months, I was able to tell her, I can see it in your appearance. I can see it in your eyes. I can see it in your smile. I can see it in the way that you interact with other people. You see, when the amazing grace of Jesus comes and invades our life, it touches everything. And that's the story we tell. Not the story of our achievements, not the story of our success, not my self-discipline or five steps to help you live a better life, but let me tell you about Jesus. And when you begin to understand, yeah, your life is ordinary. But you are also the place where God's glory dwells. You are also the place where heaven meets earth. You are also, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8. He says, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. On Easter Sunday, we remember that the resurrection is not just something that happened. It is something that is still happening. We remember that Jesus is still writing these amazing stories in our life. And so you look at your ordinary, you look at your mundane, you look at the things that you think no one else cares about. And I'm here to tell you this morning that God is working in those spaces to tell his story through you. When you show up to work, when you go to school, when you love your family well, when you're kind to your neighbor, when you do all these things and dozens of other normal, average, mundane things like that. The Spirit of God is at work in you and is at work through you and is drawing others into an experience where you can tell them your story so that they can find their own place in the resurrection story of Jesus. Will you stand with me? I want to pray for us and then the band's going to come back and lead us in a final song. Will you bow your heads and, and close your eyes with me? Jesus, we come to you today and we are so grateful for the resurrection. Lord, we're thankful that we serve a living God. One who not only defeated death, but who invites us into this new eternal life. Jesus, I pray for anyone who's in the room or online with us who's never made that decision to follow you. Lord, their observation of Easter has never been anything more than a cultural holiday. I pray today, Lord, that on Easter 2022, they would experience the resurrection as their story. They would experience the new life that you offer. And so Jesus, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins. We receive you as our Lord and Savior, and we want to walk this path of resurrection life that you're laying out for us. And Lord, I pray for those in the room who follow you, who are walking with you every day, Lord, and, and yet... It's hard for them to live with a sense of the eternal significance of each day and each opportunity. 
pray today, Lord, that you would remind us that we are not just observers of the resurrection, but we are participants in it. That the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives in us. And because of that, Lord, we get to tell your resurrection story to everyone we encounter everywhere that we go. So Lord, will you lift our eyes up to see your hand and your power at work in our lives? Will you show us, Lord, that you have called us to be people of the resurrection everywhere that we go and in everything that we do? Holy Spirit, we ask that the resurrection would become the reality of this moment of this place. Into those spaces where we doubt your involvement, Lord, will you bring resurrection power today? Into those needs where we recognize and desperately long for your intervention, will you release resurrection life once again? Lord, we ask this morning that you would restore hope, you would restore joy, you would restore our relationship with you and with one another. And Lord, we ask that your spirit would empower us to live in this story and to share it at every opportunity we're given. In Jesus' name, amen.